Um, yeah, thanks for coming today. Um, yeah, sorry we were a bit late getting started. Um, we didn't get into the room until about 10 to 11, so um, in the future maybe we'll, we'll start the thing at half 11. Um, but um, yeah, thanks so much for coming. This is the first uh, Swanish Community Assembly, and um, uh, I can't, I've got to get my notes as one of the Um, so yeah, so um, the projection screen is it's going to be not that clear today. I, I did try it and it's a little bit out of focus. So some things you might not be able to read on on the slides. Um, but what we'll do is I'll circulate the slides afterwards. Um, there is a there is a um, clipboard which Ian is going to go around and take your email details. So um, if you want to be kept informed about future events. Uh, please sign that up, sign up, and then we can send you uh, what's going on next month. You can probably read that. So that's the agenda for today. Um, um, oh yeah, if anyone needs a toilet, there's a toilet at the back there. I'm not sure if we've got the access code for the one outside. They're all, okay. all the toilets are right Okay, so yeah, so there's one there, and there's the one on the staircase if you need it. Yeah, in case of fire, that exit. Don't take the lift, take the stairs slowly. So Scott, I see you're yes. celebrating the Platinum Jubilee in John Lydon style. Yeah. I know, I know. Early for next week. Um, so yeah, so what's the Swanish Community Assembly? So this is the first one, and um, assemblies are happening all at the moment all over the country and all, all across the world. And basically, I'm trying to think of a way you can sum up what we're trying to do. Um, and this morning, I thought of it. Maybe it's, you could think of it as a as a Davos for the common man. Uh, so it's like we're sort of we're deciding what we want to do for the future. We're building our own futures as individuals and as communities. Um, so. That's the sort of way of summing it up. Um, so, the, so, the for, so the format for the day is, um, and for future ones, is we'll have a presenter, and we'll have a presenter for the first um, for the morning session, and then in the afternoon session, it's going to be more of a um, sort of discussion, a forum, where we're going to look at what initiatives are happening um, both nationally, regionally, and what we're going to do locally for lots of different subjects. So that includes legal, healthcare, education, finance. So what sort of solutions we want to build. And um, for in the, we'll bring in presenters each, each month that will cover these topics. So um, yeah, I think we're gonna have a break. So lunch, we'll have Chris speaking first and uh, take a break for lunch at probably about one o'clock for 30 minutes so you can go get something to eat and come back. And then uh, in the afternoon, we'll do the um, action groups. Um, and at the end, if we get time, we'll have like an open mic session. So if anyone wants to stand up and talk about anything that they're working on or um, share ideas or ask questions, we want to try and make it as, as uh, interactive as possible for everybody. What time's it ending? Um, probably about three o'clock, maybe a little bit before then, because we've got to kind of clean, clean up then. But yeah, about three o'clock. But if you don't want to stay for the whole thing, you know, it's up to you, but um, um, it's, uh, yeah, come and go as you want. It, it's, you know, it's quite a long day, but we have got a lot to, lot to go through. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to hand over to Chris now. So, so um, Chris is our, our guest speaker, but really he's not a guest because he's actually lives in Swanage. He's part of our group already, and uh, we're very lucky to have him. He's, um, he's been teaching and learning about um, human rights and common law for many years and he's been out of courts for many times representing himself and um, so yeah over to Chris thanks so, so much please give him a round of applause hello everyone how's everyone doing today amazing it is an absolute honor and a privilege to be here and be asked to speak on this event because this is a topic that I've held close to my heart for 10 years and I've kind of kept it a little bit of a secret because uh, the controversy of 
going up against courts and governments and police and councils and writing documents all of these years, it's not something you commonly go around discussing with people because there is a, a system, which I'll explain with the whiteboard, and then there is the common law system, which is hopefully what we will be resorting back to at some point in the future. So how many people here have heard of the common law and have studied it on some level? Put your hand up, that's a show of hands. Okay, great, wicked. How many people, this is a brand new topic? You've never heard of it? Two? No? Okay, cool. Excellent, I'm gonna bring my whiteboard in, just bear with me. I thought about a PowerPoint presentation, but whiteboards are so much better for me because I get to draw the symbols and diagrams. So, in order for me to give a clear indication of law, Law fundamentally can, can be think of, thought of in many, many different ways. You can think of it as a legal perspective. You can think of it as a lawful perspective. You've got it philosophically. You have it spiritually. You've got it religiously. Law is a profound subject when you get into it because you realize that the wool has well and truly been pulled over everyone's eyes, not just in our lifetime or our parents or our parents, but we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years 2022, where we are today, is literally 3,000 years of law, going back to the Babylonians, going back to the Paleo-Hebrewics, the Grammarians of the 13th century. All of these people were writing and figuring out different ways of using language to control and manipulate populations. And this goes back thousands and thousands of years. And if you scratch beneath the surface of any law document, you'll start seeing that the words we use today have lots of different meanings and they rely on our lack of education, on our lack of education in a lot of subjects in order for this system to be possible that we call the system. So I'm just going to draw a quick pyramid. Who doesn't love a pyramid? Um, I think this is the nice one. So when you think in terms of the current system that we're currently living in, excuse my drawing skills, we have a structure that has been built upon literally for 2,000 years. It is an absolute genius, and I'm not going to take away the level of genius that we're not against the government because we're not against the monarchies and we're not against these people. We have to understand, truly understand, why this system exists and how we got ourselves in it in order to get out of it. So we have queen level, the crown, Boom. Then we have governments. Excuse my handwriting. I'll try and make it a little bit clearer. Can you see the camera okay with the with the writing? Okay, cool. Everyone see the whiteboard okay? So then we have governments. Also in here we have military. My writing is terrible. Um, so we have the Queen, military, then we have courts. And in the court system, this is also the legal system. We'll just call it the legal system. Legal. This includes all solicitors, lawyers, and barristers. Um, and I'll explain why. Then here we have councils. Then we have the police. Now I'm only using the police because it's actually police, fire, ambulance, paramedic, stuff like that. But because we're talking about law, I'm gonna keep it just on police. And then we have the people. This is the current model that we're living in. And this has been the model since around about 1666 when they introduced a legal system. And get your head around that, 1666. So your great, 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 great grandfather was only in the 17th century. So it even affect them. This is the current system that we are living in. We the people are the majority. And this system, I'm gonna go from here this is above us, I call it above us, but all of these people derive their income from these people. So everyone that's above the pyramid, everyone that's in here, 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 pays all of their bills, all of their mortgages, all their car payments, they go on all of their holidays, and everything they have, their boats, their cars, their second homes, are because of the people. And when you get hired by these establishments, you are it is explained to you that the public is your income. 
That's how you derive your income, which is from the public. Particularly these ones, the lawyers. Bastards. Um, <laughs> because lawyers are, the reason we don't like lawyers, and the reason we don't like solicitors, even though they are a part of a society and they have families and kids and stuff, they are the great deceivers. Because they have to exist within society while pretending you know, that they're our friend. Well, yeah, trust us. We'll represent you in court. We'll, we'll take care of you, we'll love you, fully knowing that you're gonna pay for their bills, they're paying. Their job is to extract money out of the public. Because when you take a bar, when you're part of the bar association, and you, get, you take the bar exam, you are literally told you work for the courts. So every lawyer that's taken a bar examination works for the courts. That's part of the system. So the money is going all the way up the system to the top, and has done for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. This is why she has all the money, and they have all the money, and they have lots of money, and then us at the bottom, the paupers at the bottom, who went to vocational education, we didn't know any different. This is what vocational education is. A vocational means, what do you want to do to get a job? That is what a vocation is, is you pick what it is you want to do in order to work. This is why we're working class. This is part of this system, is understanding that we're not against any of these people. There may be an anxiety or an anger or a frustration when you first learn all of this, like we've been deceived for hundreds of years. We need to all get pitchforks and run out and, you know, that's not the answer. The answer is not taking down these people. The, this is why I've become an educator in this field, because the revolution will be a revelation. It's a revelation in the minds of people to realize that they don't need to fight. You don't need to fight, you just need to make a decision and all decisions are made in the mind. So this entire system will literally collapse the more people educate more people, the more people who educate, the more we share the information, the more we go out into the world and inspire and uplift other people to know this information. This system will literally evaporate. It doesn't need to be taken down with force, it will just stop. That's, that's the truth. So I'm gonna quickly talk about authority because authority the word authority, does anyone know where this word comes from? Author. Author, to write. So if you could write something, you're technically creating authority. For instance, if I put a sign on the wall that says, do not, if I put a sign outside that says, do not walk on the grass, and you read that sign, and then you don't walk on the grass, I have placed authority over you with words and writing. So this is why, I'm not going to blow your minds a little bit, but all words are spells. It's spelling, we're spelling words, because spells are magic. This is why it gets a little bit metaphysical and a bit spiritual. So language is magic. All language is magic. Right now, I'm using sound to portray a message, to portray a perspective. And I can influence everyone in this room with my intention and what I say. I can get everyone to stand up and celebrate being alive or I can make you all really depressed. I can tell you about how terrible life is and it's doomy and gloomy and terrible and everyone will be like, oh, this sucks. Or I can be like, life is a blessing and we're so happy to be alive. Wow, it's so uplifting. Like, that's the power of words. The power of words is you could, I knew as a musician my whole life that if I played a happy song, everyone was happy. If I played a sad song, everyone was sad. It was just obvious to me from the beginning that I had control over the tone of the room. And slowly over the last 10 years, using understanding language and words and power of intention, um, I literally set out on a mission to prove to myself that I could do it. And it wasn't about anything else. Um, I put my mum through hell, literally, over the last 10 years. Um, because I had this thing that once I'd learned this, once I'd figured out this kind of like, well, hold on a second, if this isn't what I was told it was, then what is this? What is this that we're living in? So I decided to take the license plates off my car, for any of you who don't know this. I threw my driver's license away, I got rid of my MOT, and I set out into the roads to try and find a police car. And I drove around until I saw one, and they ignored me. And I was like, what's going on? So I drove to Ware Room, and then I drove to Bournemouth, and then eventually I got arrested. And the police pulled me over, and handcuffed me, and put me in the car, police station. And that was the beginning of 2015. 2015. And I, at that point, I had no clue what I was doing. I just knew in my head, hold on a second, this isn't right, I'll figure this out. 
And it was arrest after arrest after arrest after car getting crushed, car getting crushed, car getting crushed, fines, court bailiffs. And I was just kept going, just keep going, just keep going. Year after year after year. After three years, there was like warrants, so many warrants out for my arrest. And it was like 70 something thousand in fines. And again, I just didn't care because I was never going to pay the fines because I hadn't hurt anyone. And part of the law journey for me was once I've realized that if you don't cause someone a loss, harm or injury, and you do not cause anyone th uh, fraud, you don't defraud anyone, then you're technically completely free. You're free. You're a free individual living on a planet. It's only the authority and the law that dictates whether you've got to pay charges and fines and taxes and all of this stuff is just only enforceable by consent. They can only get you to do those things if you unknowingly agree to it. But because we were born in the system, we haven't questioned that there could be another system. Because we're in it. It's like a fish in water. A fish doesn't know when it's swimming around the ocean that there's a sky. It's just swimming around the ocean thinking, this is it, this is my reality. It's not until you peek outside the veil when you realize that this system is an illusion. And it's completely made through the words that are enforced upon us. So, words are spells, magic. We're going back to the Ten Commandments. It was a very unruly time. There was debauchery and rapes and murders and killings, and it was not a particularly nice time to be alive. So somebody decided to create the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm not going to say who that was or why, it, whether it was God and Moses or whatever we're told, but Ten Commandments arrived, and in a way, it was a good thing. It was actually a very, very good thing, because at that time, um, when Israelites were trying to get out of uh, Egypt, they, it was a mess. We needed to stop killing, stop murdering, stop stealing, stop doing these things, and it actually brought order to what was happening. So the Ten Commandments were good, great at that time, perfect law to stop unruly behavior, stop adultering, stop doing all of those things. So then we had a period where it was Judaic law, and Judaic law lived for about 1,280 years, all the way through until we had Jesus Christ. And then Jesus came along, and I'm, I'm not going to make this religious or anything, but Jesus came along, and then there was a new way of seeing it, a New Testament. This was the beginning of like a Canalonian law. Canalonian law was the law of the Bible. It was like the, the popes, and they decreed, another word in law is a decree, where someone of authority announces something that has to be standing in law. So the Pope would decree that he owned all of the human beings on earth. And this is, a, this is a terrible thing in the Catalonian Bible, but he decreed that I, the highest member of this order, own everything on earth, every animal, every single human, and every single human that gives birth, and thus all of their children in the future. So he was obviously a psychopath. And he declared this and wrote it down and he stood there and in, according to Judaic law, if no one rebuts this in 28 days, then it becomes truth in law. And after 28 days of making this decree, it became law. And everyone in the church at the time said, okay, well, it's the law, we have to enforce it. So you have to do as you're told because this guy is, he owns you, you're a slave. And we literally for the last 2000 years have been legal slaves to the Crown Corporation. The Crown Corporation being the Queen and her family, but they are also appointed by the Vatican. The Vatican is higher than the Queen in terms of order. Um, that's why she has a little crown on her cross, because she's appointed as the highest member of this order in, in conjunction to the Pope, who is the highest according to God. Well, whatever you want to call. So then we have this order is actually lower than the the priestly order, but this is why we have a prime minister. A minister is in a church, right? And we have prime ministers running our country. So we're a very church-based system. This also goes back to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, uh, Scotland, England, and across the British um, Empire over the time. So then we have the Magna Carta. King John, 1215, was being a total bastard and he was killing loads of people, and he was just being, and the barons revolted against him. The barons, there was the first baron war and the second baron war, and the barons basically said, look, you, you, the people are gonna take, take him back to power. And King John agreed 
to do the Magna Carta in 1215. So in 1215, King John, the Baron, sat down and they came up with the Great Charter. And this is the first time in history that a king had agreed to come up with a very fair agreement that was in everyone's favor that we would all have an agreement. And the people agreed through the barons and it was fine. And it lasted 60 years, 60 years of peace until the first parliamentary act in 1291. And in the first parliamentary act, they, the people who were part of the great council, they basically started the manipulation from that point. So this system that we're living in is 1291 onwards. To get your head around that, it's been 800 years. 800 years of families, prime ministers, lords, ladies, barons, queens, kings, <laughs> just taking over each other, continuously trying to keep themselves at the top of the pyramid. This is what the elite do. The elite aren't technically against us, they're actually against themselves, because when you're at the top of this pyramid, it's cutthroat. The queen and all of those people in her circle do not trust each other, and it is very, when you study Machiavellian uh, royalty, and you look at the Italian royal family and the Swedish royal family, you see that at the very top of our society, it is not as unified as you would think it is. We're more unified at the bottom than they are at the top. They're always looking over the shoulder. They always have to have people in their inner circle. They're always making trusts and deals and declarations with each other in order to maintain their position at the top of the chessboard. This is what people think that they're all mates. They're all just hanging out on yachts, like, yeah, yeah, we're billionaires, you know? Like, no, 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 no. These people live on a nice edge. And it's not all like that, but I wouldn't want to live in this part of the pyramid, for sure. I'm much happier down here with living my best life. Um, so this is how we have a basic understanding of what it is that we're living in. Is this making sense to everyone? Everyone understanding everything? Any questions? Feel free during this whole discourse, if any question comes up, just, just put your hand up and ask the question because sometimes in these types of environments, hello. Whereabouts in there are these corporations? Corporations? Well, the, corpor the corporations are run mainly by business people who are these people. But these people, like if you've ever read Animal Farm, the closer to the top you get, the more corrupt you get, because money corrupts absolutely. Not for everyone, there are good business people out there, but what generally happens is the people with the money buy out the companies. So the guy who started Twitter, for instance, was just a regular programmer who came up with an idea. Oh, I've got this idea. I call it Twitter, it was so innocent. He's just a regular guy like you and I. And then he climbed all the way to the lofty heights of being a billionaire, and then he sold it to Elon Musk. Or he sold it to a company who then sold it to the... The company's always up in the hands of the people who are willing to buy them. And the people who are willing to buy them are the people who are willing to control everything. So, you know, who owns, who really owns the corporations is probably these people, because they, hello. But what about the corporations as in Canada as a corporation, South Africa as a corporation, yeah. Australia as a corporation? Yeah, so they're all the, all the, um, the United Kingdom is the corporation, you've got Canada as a corporation, because you have to remember from 1880, everything got incorporated, everything. So during the Industrial Revolution, Everything became industrialized. It wasn't just we were put to work and we built ships. Like that was, it was actually everything. The police stations, if you type in Swanish Police, it will be a PLC or a limited company. If you type in Westminster Police, it's a limited company on co Companies House. If you check in anything, councils or all limited companies, everything is a company. We, the people, don't own anything. We don't own anything anymore. Everything has been taken from us. The NHS is a trust. It's a private trust. We don't have any power of that. We're the beneficiaries of that trust. But we don't have any controlling, we have no control over anything, basically. And since 1974, particularly, it's got particularly bad because they, well, they're just bastards. There's no other way of putting it. In, in, in the nicest possible way, they don't even know they're doing it. They do, this is the thing, you can't really be angry about it. We can only be educated about it. Um, but you're right, all the, com all the countries in the entire world are businesses. So we're currently standing on England, but we're in the United Kingdom Corporation. And that's the really important thing for people to understand is countries exist as a landmass popping out of the ocean physically, and you can physically stand on it. But you're, 
actually entering a legal fiction, a legal entity, that when you step into that legal fiction, you have to abide by the rules and regulations of that legal company. Because England, as a landmass, doesn't have any rules. You can do whatever you want. Land is not dictating to you what you can and cannot do, because nature doesn't do that. But governments can. Again, my this is why I called it sovereignty and empowerment, because I don't do anything anyone wants me to do. I know that I'm a good person. I know that I, I, my intentions every morning is to be a loving person, to be kind, and I don't want to hurt anyone. But if I go 35 and a 30, I'm not paying anyone anything for me going 35 and 30. Like, that's my right as a living individual to decide how quick my vehicle goes. I'm not having someone else decide it for me. Now, there are idiots that drive really fast and crash into lampposts and kill kids. <laughs> This is what is really important about society as society grows, as if you look at anthropology, the history of the human family, as societies and settlements grew, they needed rules and regulations to be heavier and heavier and heavier in order to control larger populations. And now we're in the billions. So you could say that the amount of control that we're exerted under is equal to the population growing. Because as we grow, you can't have 70 million people in a country wandering around in vehicles that could kill without any rules. There has to be rules dictated in order for us to get through a day without smashing or stopping at a red light and letting the kids go past and following the traffic light system. All of these systems are amazing systems. I'm not against the system, I'm against the penalization of people to extract money out of the system. Because remember, these people pay all of these people and I, you don't need to know that she has an unlimited bank account. These people just have unlimited money because they're all connected to corporations. The courts, while they're funded by this, the legal system is funded by the public, the councils are all unlimited. They, there's just unlimited money because if they can print 300 billion for a, a first lockdown and give like there's just unlimited money. So they shouldn't, in an unlimited money capacity, be extracting money from the public who, as far as I can see, have the less money, have the least money. I would say that in terms of this, police officers on 50, 60 grand a year, maybe 30, 40 grand a year, councillors are on, even a bin man, 29 grand a year to start a job. And if you finish your career in bin services, you end up on 50,000, 60,000 a year, and you're empty bins, but you're a trained technician over your life. Courts, we all know they're minted. So as far as the population goes, most of the money is extracted from the bottom. And my thing was about, well, I'm never going to pay the fine ever to the judge. And when the judge, um, I got arrested when I came into the UK, I uh, gave him a passport in and they didn't give me my passport back. And then the police came and took me into a room. And they took me to court on the Monday. And when the judge saw me, he was like, ah, Chris, welcome. It's so good to have you back. And I was like, hey, John. <laughs> like, and I stood there and he was like, what are we going to do with you? And I said, well, you could just stop arresting me, and that would be really. He goes, no, we can't do that. And I said, well, I'm never going to pay the fine, and you're never going to send me to jail. So what are we going to do? And he said, well, we don't like people like you, Chris. We don't like people like And it became very candid and very funny, and it, he'd like, he kind of saw that I saw through the whole bullshit. And he basically said that we're never going to stop arresting you, because this is what we do. We know that you've figured this out. Well done. Congratulations. To tap your hat off to you. But while you live in this country, and while you live in this country, you will be ruled by us. He basically was like, we, you work for us, basically. And I said, well, I had to come up, I had to decide there and then what my future was going to look like. Because getting arrested is tiring. Going to the police station is tiring. Writing letters to courts and to the solicitors and going to court is a waste of time. And I realized that my time was very valuable. So I said, okay, fine. If you drop all of the, the stuff, I'll go back and get a driver's license and MOT and all the stuff. And he was like, marvelous, well done, Chris. You figured it out, good for you. And that's what I did. I literally drew a line in the sand. He dropped all of the fines. And I went back into the system, got a driver's license and fully went back into the system fully without any question. Because as far as time and energy goes, this is why I've become an educator. Because individuals doing this will just be arrested and fined and penalized. But if we can get a collective group of 20, 30, 50, 60, 100,000 people, millions of people all knowing this information and having the power and the knowledge to say no to these people, 
then we have active change. Then we, we can actually have a voice. But if we all just individually know it and we're like, yeah, I'm gonna get out of the system here, don't do it. I'm not even here to advocate it. I'm not even here to promote it because you would just literally be wasting your time, your money, uh, your energy, your thought processes. And I became fearless in this approach. I don't know who I am or why I'm on this planet, but I just didn't care. I just didn't care. I was like, well, I've got no fear, so I might as well just do it. And I wasn't cared about any of the ramifications. I wasn't afraid of anything that was possibly going to happen to me because I ultimately knew that I hadn't hurt anyone. Nobody had ever been hurt from my actions. And that's, that's what they knew. That's why they never sent me to jail. So, while writing to these individuals, you have to understand the Prime Minister, when he's in um, the House of Commons, they always refer to each other as the right honourable gentleman. And there's a reason for this. It's because law is based on honour. And it's something that we, I never really fully understood honour or respect or any of those things. But I used to write to these people from a very victim perspective. You're doing this to me? How can you do this to me? I've never done anything wrong. I was angry, I was frustrated, I was, I was just annoyed. And I was writing to them from that perspective. And when those people receive those letters, they throw them in the bin and carry on sending you letters that they want. They don't acknowledge letters that are written from a victim perspective. What they want is you to say, Dear Sir, with a full appreciation of your position in this situation, I would love to inform you that da, 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 I won't be doing this and I won't be doing this. Thank you so much. Uh, with respect, with no hard feelings, Chris. Fine. You position yourself equal to them, so you're looking in their eyes. And in doing so, they take that letter and they go, oh yeah, this person knows what they're doing. Okay, cool. And then it's a game of chess. You're playing a language game of chess with the system. Because if you can get the, the language right, you literally, I've had police apologizing in letters. Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Like, oh. <sighs> what did I send them? <laughs> so I went back to my laptop and I opened the letter and I was like, okay, this, this works. This is the way I'm going to write letters from now on. Because you, as you study, as you learn the language, as you understand the power of language, um, you can even get to the point where you're above them and you're talking down to them. Who the hell do you think you're talking to? Sending me letters, stuff like that. And they're like, oh, shit, I'm so sorry. Like, oh, oh, God, who are you? You can literally not just be a victim or look them in the eye. You can, I've, I've told policemen to get away from me that they're wasting my time. Get away from me, you're wasting my time. And they go, oh, okay. A well-spoken, well-dressed individual, get away from me. All right, fine, they won't hassle you. But that's the way society works. If I was in a hoodie with a beard, they're like, they'll just be on me like a ton of bricks. Like, that's just how public perception works. So, as I went through the legal journey, I learned legal languages. So, one of the most incredible things to learn is a conditional acceptance. I always say this to everyone, and this is, a conditional acceptance is you fully accepting that they're sending you a letter, but you have your own conditions first. It's a little bit of a pushback, but it's a polite way of saying, no, 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 no,
And they're like, oh, yeah, that'll be four grand. And you're like, oh man, I lost the case, I've got to pay this list as well. There, don't trust them. I'm sure there are nice solicitors out there, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bad map all of them because I've met some amazing people on my journey, but don't trust them. Um, <laughs> so we got a conditional acceptance. A conditional acceptance is, thank you so much for your letter regarding this thing. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a court or a council or a tax bill or a utility bill or a company or a phone bill from a phone company, anything. If someone's trying to get money out of you and you don't feel like it's justified, like it's an overextension of their liberty, it's an overextension of their position, and you're like, man, why am I paying this? Just send them a conditional acceptance. Thank you so much for your letter where you want another X amount of pounds from me. Can you please send me, before I pay you, because I want to pay you, because I'm I'm going to honour you, your position. But before I pay you, can you please send me the contract that we have so I can read all the terms and conditions? Just send me the contract. If there is a contract between you and I, then there can be debt. There can be a debt. If there's no contract, then there's no debt. So please send me the contract. I'd like to read it. Once I've read the terms and conditions, I will send you the money immediately. Immediately. Of course, if there's anything to do with courts or councils or anything, there's no, there's no contract. This is all by consent. This is all by consent, which means you've never physically signed a living contract to agree to this, ever. Now if you have, well, I suppose you could say that when we go into a police station and they make you sign your name, you're signing consent. When they make you into a courtroom, they make you sign something, you're signing consent. When you sign your council tax thing, you're signing consent, little micro consents, hello. About the road traffic app, then, is the actual signing of your driving license yeah. consent? Yes. Yeah, that's why everyone contacts me through TikTok. And they're always like, how do I get out of the parking fine? How do I get out of the speeding yeah. ticket? And I say, pay the speeding ticket and stop speeding. And they're like, wow, I thought you, I thought you were getting people out of this. I can't get you out of you if you're in it. Like, how, you, you've chosen to have a driver's license. You have, and the word license means to ask permission for. So you're asking permission to drive a car that you don't even own because the registration plate on your car, registration means to give up your right of, to register something is to give up your right. So when you register your car and you put a registration plate on it, you're basically giving the, your car to the queen and then you have to ask permission to the queen with a driver's license if you can drive the car. And she says, yes, you can. So then you get your driver's license off the Queen and you travel around in, in, in the Queen's car and if you don't follow the rules and regulations of the Road Traffic Act, which you've agreed to, she will come and take the car off you because she owns it and you don't own your car. This is a horrible thing to realise if you just spent 50 grand on a Mercedes. <laughs> um, but you don't own it at all. <laughs> you don't own your cars. No one owns a car. Nobody owns a car here because a registration means to give up the ownership of. So this is, this is why it's so genius. This, these people are genius, genius, geniuses. And I'm not even angry, I'm more in awe of its genius, really. That's really why I became an educator in this topic. So we have this system that is almost like a veil that's put over our eyes, and we don't even know it exists. We don't even know it's there. It's so all-pervasive. It, it, They've done it so miraculously well because it covers every single part of our lives, from the council taxes to the income taxes. Like, we don't even pay income tax. We don't, you know, none of us here pay income tax. They just take it off you. <laughs> Is it voluntary income tax? If you choose to pay it and allow them to take the money from you, then it's your choice. And, and they, they've automated it so perfectly that we don't even, we don't even get to see that money. <laughs> It's like, it's just automatically deducted from us. Like, they don't even trust us to pay it. They're like, no, 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 just take it from them. Um, and that is a, is a big pill to swallow for a lot of people because we realize that- What about that, if you're self-employed? Yeah, so self-employment. Again, if you register yourself self-employed, mm -hmm. what are you doing? But if you don't register. Yeah, I'm private. Yeah. Which means I don't exist on paperwork. Everything I make is mine. Everything I make is private, and I live my life. Yeah. I don't want to be a part of this situation. And there isn't a king, queen, government, court in the land that can convince me to do anything they want me to do. Have you registered as a sovereign being? 
No. No, you're just. Not Why would I register being yeah, a sovereign? Yeah, not register, but. Um, yeah. No, I just, I just decided. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, that's a journey in itself. We're, we're going to move on to sovereignty. I'm just going to talk about letters and trusts, and then we'll talk about sovereignty. But mm. the thing is about register and self-employed is you're basically saying I'm self-employed, but I'm in the system. So then they're like, right, you got to pay tax return. Come on, first of April, you got to cough up money. Oh, I haven't done my tax return. Oh, yeah, you need to do it. So being self-employed in the system, you might as well just have a job. The only difference is you get to fiddle the books a little bit if you want. And you get to play around with money a little bit easier. And it's not automated and you've got to be responsible. But um, I am not advocating that the system gets destroyed because there's a lot of benefits to this system. The bins get collected. Water flows through our taps. Street lights come on, everything is clean, all of the uh, brass is cut, everything is amazing in this country. We shouldn't be trying to destroy the system, because if it did, we'd live in hell. It would just be anarchy. So, hello. Can I just ask, you said that that system is obviously not the same as being created, so it's not essentially as real. But then you're saying that if you signed up, so you registered the car or whatever, then you are in it. System is just a BS system and it's just made up by them, then surely it doesn't mean anything. So you can um, I don't know, not pay a fine or whatever because that system is just created, has been created, but it still shouldn't mean anything. Is that yeah, right? That's right, yeah. It doesn't mean anything. It's the amount of people that it's the amount you can send but to. It, to you, you, sort of, you, were, you alluded to the fact that you know if you did decide to get driving license and you, because you signed it, then all of a sudden you are contracted to do all these things. That's right. But if, if this whole framework and contract is BS, then it should still not matter at all because it's, it's a false system. Yeah, it is, a, it, it is a false system, but the issue we're having is that the system is so good that stepping out of the system right now as people is a mistake. We shouldn't do that. If you have a driver's license, just drive the speed limit, please. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll give you points and then take your car off you. Like, because unless 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 people step out of the system at the same time, and we all say no together, individually, we, it's impossible. Like, this is an incredible system. It's genius. Hello, sir. Chris, how long was your journey? Um, uh, 2014. I left my wife, and uh, I came back to Swanage, and I was like, why? New life, here we go. And my mate literally started showing me videos about a courtroom in America. And I was like, in complete disbelief. I was like, no, 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 this is bullshit. And he was like, no, no, you have to, you have to watch this video. And I watched a guy arguing with a judge in American court, and he knew his shit. And he was like, I will not stand here. I am a sovereign being, and you have no authority over me. And the judge said, okay. And the judge left the courtroom. And then he says, as the highest ranking member of this court, as the judge has left the stand, I now dismiss this case. Thank you very much. Mic drop. <laughs> he walked out of the court case, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I need to know this. Like, Chris, is it, we're all in the system yeah. at some degree or another. That's right. Is there a, I keep seeing a pack uh, for sovereignty, which goes to all of these things to, to declare yourself out of the system. Is there such a thing? Yeah, so I bypass this because when when you realize that you're in the system, there's loads of paperwork you can do to get out of it. They're like, claim back your sovereignty, claim back your living title and say that. I don't even do that. Why would I do what they want me to do to get out of their system? Like, I'm in their system. They're like, well, if you want to get out of our system, you have to fill out this form. Stick your form up your... I, do I don't need to fill out a form, thank you. I've just made a decision not to not to be in the system. Because so. of the contracts that we were all taken out over everything, is there a way to cancel the contracts? The cancel that or just do They're that? all void. Okay. All contracts are void because you didn't know you were signing them. And in order under the Bills of Exchange, eighteen eighty two, in order for a contract to be valid, mm. there has to be a meeting of the minds, there has to be an agreement, there has to be an offer, there has to be a consideration, and there has to be an acceptance. Yeah. In order for a contract to exist, so if all of you have unwill unknowingly ended up in a situation where you're financially being rinsed and you don't understand why and it's but you can actually technically go, okay, well, I'm an idiot. Because in legal terms, the word idiot means I didn't know. And if you're a legal idiot, you're out of court straight away. A lot of people plead insanity when they go to a criminal case. Oh, I'm insane. 
because then they get off the case. But in a legal civil situation, you can plead idiocy, which is, hey, I'm an idiot. <laughs> and they go, All right. Chris, in, if you read contract law in the academic literature, like you're studying at a university, it doesn't give you that information about what makes a contract. No, so I, I mean, what you're I mean, saying is not. They do give it to you, but they don't. They don't. They do give it to you, but they don't make it important. Like they do educate people in contract law. Because if I study, like if you go into Stanford University or that, and you look at their legal, um, uh, their legal curriculum, it is like the top of the top of the top. Um, and it depends on what branch of law you're going into. Because law is such a massive subject. Most people who study law study a tiny bit of law, and then they specialise in a tiny bit of their subject in order to function in society as a lawyer who sells a house. So they've studied how to do that. But they haven't looked at it as a philosophical you know, spells, magic, you know, like it's a huge topic. And that's the simplest thing I know about contract law is I can't have a contract. Even if I signed a contract, you could say that you were signed under duress, like you were coerced into signing the contract. And a lot of the police tactics of all the times I spent in police cells and being in police interview rooms they are trained to extract the information that they require so that you can go to court and be penalized. Because all the policemen arrest you and they put you in a cell, then they take you from the cell to the interview room and they have to wait for someone to come down. An hour I had to wait in this interview room. And then this guy come in and he wasn't a policeman. This guy was a trained linguist. And he was a master and I sat there with him and he was like, okay, Chris. And his questions were probing questions and they were positioned that I would convict myself. And if you don't know that, and you're just sitting scared in an interview room, you're automatically convicting yourself just by speaking. This is why I had to wait for this guy to come along, because he was very well trained. I picked up on it straight away, and I just stayed completely silent. And it's a hard thing to do when you're in a police cell. <laughs> when you're in a police room, and there's two policemen there, and they're asking you questions, and you're like... <laughs> it's, really, it's really hard to stay quiet in this situation. I went on the Guardian 300 briefs and they were talking yep. about setting up common law courts. Yep. So is that the way that we, yeah. as a mass, yep. come out of the system? Yeah, and you can request a common law court in any in any situation. But if it's a civil thing, they won't, because it's civil. You don't oh. civil and common law, unless you've broken a contract or there's been some kind of disagreement on a contract or you're, you're owed money or something like that. It's called a court de jure. A court de jure means a court with a jury, and a de jure means 12 people from society who can dictate whether you are, that's why the jury decide. Even the judge doesn't decide in a common law court, the jury decide, then the people, rep the jury is representative of the people. This is why common law is really important. So you can always request a common law court for any case. Whether they grant it to you or not is another thing, because they don't want people just going to common law courts all the time because they're actually expensive, because you've got to get 12 people from society and pay for them. There's a grand a day <laughs> for them to take time off their jobs. So from a business perspective, a common law court is way more expensive uh, and less lucrative, because they need this type of court in order to extract the money out of you. So in, in terms of business model, um, the common law court is less monetary for them. So they're always pulling away from the common law courts. But if you, com if you commit a criminal case, it's automatically a common law court. Like if you go and kick someone in, or you steal something, or you defraud someone, automatically common law. It's no longer civil because you've, it's criminal, and criminal is common law. So that's it. That's why if you don't cause anyone a loss, harm, or injury, you're free. You're a free individual on this planet, unless you live in this system. Um, and this system is all pervasive. It exists, and we just have to accept that it exists. Sometimes learning this information is quite heavy, because you're like, wow, man, I live in the system. But the more people that know about this, the better it will be ultimately. And this is my first ever public speaking gig on this matter. I've only ever done Zoom conferences and talking to people online about it. So, um, Does anyone have any questions before I move on to sovereignty? Hello. Um, so in terms of, uh, like, They ignore you for a while. Yeah. Just keep, just keep doing it. Yeah, just keep doing it, and just show them the same letter. Do you, and you haven't answered my last question. Yeah. So, just answer my question. Like, 
and so then never had really like uh, you know a, a legit kind of contract. Contract. Have you ever signed a contract to pay council tax? <laughs> no. And why are you doing it? But the thing is, we're told that we have to contribute to a society. Mm. Oh, if we don't pay council tax, who's going to empty the bins? Right? Yeah, so we feel that we are contributing to our society. <laughs> and for that reason, you should pay council tax. Right? Oh. Because if you want your bins collected, who else is going to do it? Yeah, it's a valid argument. You know, but but the, the issue we're having is if you do the maths, if you do the maths, the mathematics, and we'll use Swanage as an example, if you added up all of the council tax that everyone pays in a month, and you divide it by the public services we receive, 25% of the money that they take monthly goes on what we get. Which means 75% of the money that we give monthly is, who knows where that goes? Goes into the ether every month. So for that reason, we should offer them money because we want the society that we live in. What we should do is be having reform. We should be reforming the system and, and getting what the community together to decide, why are we paying 150 quid a month? I only want to pay 35 pound a month for it. 35 pound a month to have your bins collected, to have um, the gardens kept, to have the clerk put in the town hall, the police are available, not that they're even here anymore. So not that the ambulance has taken an hour to come from Bournemouth. So Swanage in and of itself doesn't even have the public amenities that we're even paying for because they've just been stripped back, stripped back, stripped back. And so, yeah, ask questions. Have you ever asked that for a, like, a breakdown of where your, yeah. your money is? Yeah, yeah, they never send it to you. They send you like one of those little things saying, please commissioner of Dorset gets this much. And, and they, they send you a little itemized saying, uh, the random people that you don't even consider, like people who live in Bournemouth Town Hall or something like, oh yeah, the clerk won first removed at the second president, that guy, he gets 67 pounds a day. And, oh, but they need paying. Remember, if you're ask, no, this is not the band. If you're asking, if you're asking, you are as the king. Because Henry VIII, if you read Machiavellian philosophy, Henry VIII was once asked a question and he said, I am the king, I only ask questions. I don't answer them. So if you're asking a question, you are the king. So this leads into sovereignty, which is ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask where all your money's going. It's okay to ask what the money's being spent on. In fact, the more you engage in those types of letters and conversations and knocking on doors and saying, hey, what's going on behind this door? And hey, what are you doing in this meeting? And what are you doing with this money? Like, the more we do that, the quicker this will unravel and reform itself. Hello. Chris, just quickly, when, you, um, when you're paying your council tax and you have been paying your taxes yep. all this period of time, yep. are you not bound by the contract of the fact that you've been doing it? You are under contract. Like, does that, does that become a contract because you've abided it's by it. and yeah. agreed to it even though there is no physical contract? Yeah, because join, yeah, joinder, joinder. So joinder is where you, joinder can even be a physical expression. It doesn't even have to be a verbal agreement. For instance, the way they get joinder in court is to say, all stand, it's genius. And they make everyone stand up. And as soon as you've done as you're told, they're like, yep, joinder. And then everything that happens after that point, so when they make you all stand in a court and the judge comes in, they basically, everyone has agreed to the judge, to what the judge is going to say. So it's very, very hard that when you're in those situations to stay sitting down. Everyone stands up and you're sitting there. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it! And they're like, state your name. I don't have a name. Not today. And you just have to play this opposite game and it annoys them, but I just did it for fun. Like it, for me, it wasn't even, a, they were getting all upset, but um, for me, it was a bit of a giggle. Um, so yeah, any questions? I saw a couple of things up here like, so just going back to the uh, bit about uh, the UK being incorporated in Canada and so on, where can you find them being registered? As on Companies House. The UK, well, Dylan Bradford is not a registration, it's just a credit company. So, and because I've seen it on Dylan Bradford, you know, they've got all the yeah. but that's not a registration site. Company House is. Yeah. So is there anywhere else? Can, yeah, because Dylan Bradford is literally a credit search company. So is there somewhere else where they're registered? I only check Company's House, because it's the I, Queen's... I, I just had a look at UK, got UK <coughs> is that, what, what was that? UK? Man, if you went down that rabbit hole, you would discover 50. There's probably UK Incorporated Limited, UK uh, Soliciting Limited, United Kingdom Corporation Limited, so because they are all... They're using all those businesses. 
all of them. Like Tony Blair is a limited company. So what, Tony, what happened, Tony Blair, when he was preparing, he was at Westminster and he was preparing for, uh, to become the Prime Minister and he was about 11 years off his Prime Ministerhood. Um, he was, basically, he'd sexually assaulted loads of people in the north of England and loads of criminal cases put against him. He immediately went and changed his name. That's the first thing he did. He went and changed his name to Barry blah blah blah. And then he sent a letter to them saying, I must be under this name because he had to protect the Tony Blair brand. So he immediately legally changed his name and he wouldn't answer to Tony Blair anymore. And he basically went through two and a half years of pretending to be Barry something until he got off the case. It was all disponged and disappeared and he paid all the lawyers and barristers and all that. And then he changed his name back to Tony Blair, carrying on living his life. So the United Kingdom Corporation, they're moving money around all the time. So there's probably 20 shadow corporations in this. And <laughs> one company is inside another company and then a trust owns that company. And then it's an umbrella company. Like you, again, Genius. This is a genius system. And this, when you go to Eton and when you go to these um, boys' schools like the Eton and the Harrows, they're not learning how to like do stupid shit that we're doing. Like, they're not learning that. If you read the curriculum of what these people are learning, they're learning rhetoric. They're learning, I mean, rhetoric's a huge topic when it comes to being a politician because you're basically side-swiping actual conversations. You're basically, someone will ask you a direct question and you will, it's genius level of rhetoric, which is the ability to answer without actually ever answering. So the audience go, wow, that was great. But then if they really think about it, the politician never really said anything of any value. They're taking the words you ask the question, they're saying the words, they're saying yes, yes, well, yes, blah, blah, blah. That is what they're learning at Eton and Harrow. They're learning how to handle themselves in public spheres how to handle corporation tax, how to move stuff around. They're not learning how to chisel out a piece of wood to make a little toilet roll holder for your mum. <laughs> like, at school, like, mum, I made you this. Like, <laughs> get out of here. Like, um, that's not what they're doing. Any questions? Yes, hello. Can you explain um, what happened in March 2001 with Article 61? Yes, yes I can. So in, my, in, in 2001, thank you for bringing that up. This is the lawful rebellion. So in 2001, the Queen signed a European Act to allow the European courts to dictate English law. And in doing so, she breached the Magna Carta. Because up until that point, English law was English law. The King, the governments, the courts, the councils, everything. And we, the people, lived under that. But when the Queen signed that document, she breached the Magna Carta because she allowed a foreign nation to dictate our courts. So then the barons, luckily, some awake individuals, decided to put a claim in against her and say, hey man, welcome. Um, they put a claim in against her to say, hey, you have breached the sovereignty of your, and she never replied, she never replied. So then Article 61 was invoked, and that's still going on now, after 21 years. Uh, I was in that for a while, because it helped, you can send those documents off if someone's trying to get to you. And you can say, I've invoked Article 61 of the Magna Carta. I stand by the barons in lawful rebellion. And thank you very much. That's where I stand in terms of that case. And you can, I know lots of people who use uh, Article 61 and lawful rebellion to protect themselves because they don't want to be a part of the system. They want to step. I'm, I've got one foot in the system, one foot out of the system because I see the benefits of it and I'm not anti it. But um, yeah, the lawful rebellion is huge. and. Now we're out of Europe, I actually don't know where we stand. Because now we're out of Europe. So I don't think the European courts are dictating us anymore. So maybe that doesn't even stand. Huh? Now it's the World Economic Forum and the WHO and all that stuff. But we're not going to get into that. The, the, the right to remain silent, does that actually work then? 100%. In every situation. It is the, it is the secret and weapon of everything. Like. Yeah. With every policeman, with every policeman, every court, every council, everyone, just ask them the question. Just ask them, do I have the right to remain silent? They'll say, uh, yeah. And they'll be, great. Thanks for that. Right. And then you just stand there making conversation with them about whatever you want. And when they want to proceed on their way, you just say, no, I'm going to stay silent. Thank you. And when you get to a police station or a court or a council or anyone, if anyone's trying to oppress you or oppose you in any way, just stay silent. Any court, anything to stay silent, because they need you to talk in order to continue their procedure. They need you to agree to some kind of 
joined her. Your name, hi, can you tell me your name? I always say, what's your name? I always give it back, give it, everything they're giving you, give back to them. So, and he goes, well, my name is PC Michaels. And I say, your mum named you PC Michaels? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 that's my job. I didn't ask you what your job was, I asked you what your name was. And they're like, uh, we're not obliged to give you our names. Well, then I'm not obliged to give you my name. And you just make it even. You just make it completely even. And you just ask them, do I have the right to remain silent? You can play, if you know what you're doing, you can play with it. Uh, it doesn't have to be a serious thing. So. They wouldn't let you do that. Well, they have to, because you, if whatever you register, you can deregister. Yeah, just keep going. They don't want people deregistering because they, they lose power. Like, <laughs> well, I know. Well, if we all registered, like even our children, this is, it's 1666. In 1666, I'll do it here. No relevance to the 666, I don't know what I'm saying. But in 1666, they, started a trust for all of us and it was through the birth certificate and they basically it was the first ever birth certificate and because they owned us or well, the vatican owned us they decreed that the children that were being born were theirs we didn't even own our children that's what a birth and death registration certificate is we're giving our children to the state we are registering our children as ownership of the state so then they can tell us what to do in the Crown Corporation. They can tell us how to live and how to how fast to go and what to eat and what to drink. And they can dictate a lot of things because we're not actually free. We're technically slaves. That birth certificate is a bond, an insurance certificate that they, depending on your grades at school, I'm gonna go really into this, but depending on how intelligent you are, you're worth more to them. So if you're getting Ds and Es in school, they can't make as much money from you, but if you're a straight A student, then you're actually worth more to them in the stock market, because you'll actually end up becoming a doctor or a lawyer or someone of, of stature, and you'll pay higher taxes. So if, from the state's point of view, that's why they grade us all the way through school, and they put us in different groups, like foundation and intermediary and higher classes, because they're trying to dictate and determine who's going in which direction. Who's gonna be stacking the shelves at co-op, and who's gonna be doing brain surgery? They need to know that in advance. So they're grading us all the time about how to move forward. Hello. So this particular piece is probably like a 15 hour lecture of an American who his name is Charles Denang or Diego. And he did like a 15 hour lecture on the educational system from Greek into Roman into Catholic, into modern day English, and how uh, different branches of education in terms of how to produce. His basic thing is, governments know how the education, education system is affecting the future. So if they want, um, they want to have a massive war in 45 years, well, they need lots of technicians now, so they like fund things here. They're like, well, we're really boosting the sciences this year. We need as many people to be in science as possible. And we think, oh, great, yeah, cool. And there's a science fate going on, and science and science, and all these kids grow up. And then they're just programming us early, leading us in the direction that they need us to be in, in the future. I just wondered if there was a way that you could find your name on some sort of registry yeah, or something. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know where that is personally. Um, I, I just became addicted to studying. Um, I lo lost a lot of years. <laughs> well, I gained a lot, but um, I just, I can't even recall some of the information that I, I mean, I was listening to an audio a book for five years. An audio book a day for five years, but um, audio books are like two or three hours, so I just listened to one a day. For probably about 2,000 audio books about everything, every subject I could find from, you know, law, language, spirituality, um, empowerment, anything, anything I could digest, I was just absorbing and absorbing, because I always knew that I would go into public speaking. And yeah, this guy, American guy, just one of the most cleverest, he's a Stanford University professor who saw the light, and instead of teaching the, the education in, in the system, he decided to go out on his own and, and teach 
what they're doing through the education system and why it's not actually benefiting us at all. True education is you studying your passion. You studying your passion, that's true education. Studying things that are put in front of you at school is not education, we're just learning a whole bunch of stuff that's irrelevant to us. Would you say education kills creativity then? Not if you're studying what you're passionate about, because then you're developing and enhancing what you're doing for creativity. Um, the wrong education will completely kill creativity. That's why they put the flat caps on the university people. You know the caps? Of all the shape of a hat you could possibly pick, they've got a little flat thing on top, because they're capping the level of inter They're literally showing you that you've reached the ceiling, and <laughs> you've, you've reached the top, and they put the flat caps on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you could say that the more inter intelligent you become through an education, sure, we need brain surgeons, we need people who are highly educated, but I would say 75% of the things studying university are irrelevant. Media studies, you know, like social things and stuff like that. Not that they're important, but they're not contributing to us moving forward as a, as a nation. Um, so notices, while we just come off this, notice is you're notifying these establishments of what you want, your truth. Instead of living by their ways of telling us what to do, eventually you get to the point where you're like, no, no, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to live according to my own truth. I know I'm a good person. I know that I don't want to cause anyone a loss, harm or injury. So then you notify them of the changes in your life. I hereby notify you that I am no longer going to be doing anything you want me to do. I'm hereby to notify you that these things that you're asking of me, I don't agree with or consent to, and for that reason, I won't be paying it. Thank you so much. You're just notifying them. You're letting them know that you have changed your perspective. You're letting them know you've changed your mind. Is that um, with everything, like gas, water, electricity? Just ask them. Um, okay, so utilities. Oh. I like <laughs> having, I love having water coming yeah. through my taps at home. That's why I pay it. If you can figure out a way of getting water to come through your tap at home without paying for it, mm. then be my guest. But people automatically think, right, we're gonna get my, I'm gonna go on my utility bills. Right, well, just stop. I don't agree with the prices, and for that reason, you should just, because the law is based on remedy, I would offer the people what you think you should pay. If they're like 300 quid, like, no, no, I'll pay you 35 pounds, thank you. They have to accept it by law. Right. Because law is all based on remedy. Yeah. You, you can't completely flat out and deny to pay it, but you can offer them something. Yeah. So with the utility bills, they're also squeezing us a lot at the moment. Like you, you can all tell the energy prices, the fuel prices, the taxes, everything is just ridiculous. But you can ask them why they're putting chemicals in the waters and stuff like that. Yeah, and ask, questions. ask, them, yeah. Yeah, ask yeah. them. Ask them for a, a chemical readout of yeah. everything that's in the water. And just keep asking them, keep asking them, keep asking them, keep asking them. Ask as many questions as you can because you're also, the good thing about asking, hello. Uh, also, the, uh, the fluoride in the water is not the same grade fluoride that's in toothpaste. It's not? It's a lower grade fluoride because it would be very expensive to put toothpaste grade fluoride in the water. But there's still fluoride in the water. But there's still fluoride in the water. Well, there goes the pineal gland. <laughs> um, so notifying people. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. So, if you are wanting to make somebody an offer as in a remedy, you say, regardless of what it is, um, I don't agree with X, Y, Z in mind, I will offer you this. Would you use the word remedy to include a final settlement? Yep. What would you, how would you I would position put, it? I would put a conditional acceptance, which is the previous letter, which is like, I accept that I have to pay this bill. Yeah. But there are conditions attached to it, according to my truth. Uh, instead of just being sheep and just doing as you're told, we put a condition in there, which is like, I'm happy to pay for the gas, but this is a ridiculous price. Like, I'm, not, I'm not gonna pay this price. I don't have this kind of money, and I'm not gonna just, I'm not gonna not pay, I'm not gonna not feed my children to pay this gas bill. There's just no way I'm doing that. Put it in the letter, be completely honest and vulnerable. I am not gonna not have what I want in my life so that you can have more money. So regardless of what it is, if you want to make a settlement with someone, anyone, you want anyone. to agree a settlement, yeah. okay, you would say, okay, I, I accept that there is a debt here. Yeah. Um, under this 
circumstances and I'm, I'm offering you as remedy yeah. XYZ amount including final settlement, something like that. Yes, and you could even say, because um, another thing about chess, verbal chess, is you have to let them know that you know. So you can say, under the Bills of Exchange, which is an amazing document written in the 1880s, um, you can go into the Bills of Exchange and look at all that, and it kind of like clarifies how money operates. It's like the rules and regulations of money. And you can always resort back to it, because it's a completely fair document. It works in our favor and their favor. That's why it's a bill, and not just a law. They have to find it reasonable, yeah. because they're asking you for 200 pounds, and you don't think that's reasonable. If you offer them 25 pounds, they might not think that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. So then there there's a, comes a chance where you end up paying 70 pounds. Mm -hmm. But it's in everyone's right to do that. Yeah. No one has to pay anything to any human on this earth or any corporation if they don't want to pay it. We've been bred to just do as we're told. We had to put our hand up to go to the toilet at school, and this was the beginning of the end which is when you're at home and you're a four-year-old, you just go to the toilet. You're like, oh, mommy, I need to pee. Or, okay, cool, let's go, and you go to the toilet. And you think that's completely normal. Going to the toilet is a completely natural activity, but when you go to school, it begins asking permission to do stuff. No, you gotta put your hand up to do anything. And that's the beginning of the conditioning. Now we're 40, 50, 60 years senior, and we're still asking for permission to do everything and you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. And if you don't want to pay energy bills, stop paying them. Just flat out. They'll never cut you off. And if they do, then that's the journey we'll have to be on right now. They will cut you off if you're a smart meter of the time. That's oh, yeah. why I keep the answer as long as you can. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Chris, um, it strikes me that the people in that triangle, the system yep. above us, mm -hmm. don't want us to really know what the definition of some of these words are. Yep. Um, is there a go-to place where some of us could do some homework on, yeah. on understanding the definition of... Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, Black Law's Dictionary. Yeah, there's six, there's six editions, uh, no, there's nine editions now, and I found the sixth one the best, I bought it and I studied it, and it gives you all of the legal and lawful definitions. For instance, summons, as a society, we think we've been summoned to court. Summons means invited. It's an invitation. They're inviting you somewhere, but we have the idea that summons means we have to go. The king has summoned us to court, like in the king's chamber. But it's just an invitation. But they've given the words different meanings so that we act differently. And that's where the genius level of manipulation comes in. They've literally changed the meaning of words so that we follow orders. Uh, but Black Law's Dictionary is the best place for definitions. Just to add that, I've got the most recent Blacks, and it is interesting reading. You look at a word like uh, mandate. Mandate is a contract that protects you and you, it says very clearly on page 600, whatever it is, of Black Law Dictionary, that um, you can't, it's not to enforce you to do something. It has your consent yeah. and it protects you. And you are the mandatee, yeah. and there's a mandator, and yeah. it's a contract. Yeah. You're not going to be told that. No, so we had to follow these mask mandates and all stuff. Yeah. And, and who had ever heard of the word mandate up until then? We're like, oh, yeah. it's a mandate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's got the word man in it as well, which makes it even yeah. worse. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, when I was living in Bournemouth, uh, much to my wife's disdain, because she wasn't on the journey that I was on, uh, I was like, I'm not paying council tax. If we're going to have a place together, we just, we're not paying council tax, ever. And she kicked off big time. And I had to come to some kind of level agreement. So I took myself, I basically wrote to them saying, I don't want to be branded in a band. Yeah. You know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They put you in bands and brackets so they can just take money off you. You need to say, I don't want to be banded, I don't want to be in a council tax brand, and I'm happy to pay 50 pounds a month for these things. Yeah. And you just say it, and you send it to them. They'll ignore you. Yeah. Do it again, <laughs> don't stop. Keep doing it until they pay attention to you, and eventually they'll pay attention to you because you're not paying council tax. Because yeah. you're not paying until they've agreed. That's quite interesting because I'm, I'm moving soon, actually, to Bournemouth, but like, yeah. um, this is one of the things before I even start paying it is to start that negotiation and not pay it until it's a journey. It's a proper journey, and I, I mean, choose your own adventure. That's what I say to everyone. Choose your own level of pushback. 
Like some people like me are just like, let's just do it and just see what happens. And some people just want to just write a few letters and you know choose your own adventure. Um, no, they ended up paying fifty-six pounds a month for one year, and then after that year, they started sending me one hundred and fifty pounds again. They started sending one hundred fifty pound bills again, and um, well, that marriage ended, so I left. Um, <laughs> it's fine now. Anyway, hello. CCJs. It's like how they get back at us. Like ruining our credit and putting a CCJ against our name and against our business is another thing that the legal system have created in order to control us. Like I said, choose your level of uh, adventure because um, I wouldn't personally want a CCJ against me because it would just affect everything. It affects everything in my life. So this is where we got to play the one foot in the system, one foot out of the system game because you know, look, I don't have a mortgage and I don't have credit cards, so I'm a very blessed guy. I don't have any debt at all. Um, but the world that we're living is so pervasive, it's included in every single pocket of our society that you don't want a CCJ against your name because trying to get one of them removed is a pain. So if you've gone for the remedy and you're paying something, yep. they then have the right to give you a CCJ? If they're not happy with the amount of money, if, if they haven't agreed. But this is the thing about corporations, is they don't give, they don't give a shit. They don't shit. They don't care a bit about you. You don't even, you're a piece of crap on that shoe. So they'll just ignore your letters and just carry on doing what they want and then send you a CTJ and they're at the top of their business not caring about who you are. This is why I'm like, choose your battles carefully. Because when you, you can contact your mortgage company for instance and say, hey, can you send me the contract so I can have a read of it? They'll never send it to you, ever. Ever, 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 because they don't have it. They don't actually have it, physically have it, they sell it. As soon as you've signed a contract, a mortgage, and they've made you the money and you're paying them, they've got a bond in your name that's worth 150,000 quid, they sell it. They make money off your debt, so, hello. How can we translate from an individual basis of doing these things into a more kind of collective way to so that we're just not doing it as individuals, but where we've got a community behind yeah. us. Well, like, like you just, this is like, for Swanage, this is great. We've got like-minded people coming together talking about what it is that we want. What do we want? Uh, this is happening on a, a national scale and an international scale. Like two years ago when they put us into lockdown, it woke a lot of people up. I was kind of half expecting something to happen like this anyway. So when it happened, I called my mate and I was like, it's happening. <laughs> it's bloody happening, isn't it? He's like, I told you. Take off a tinfoil hat. I'm like, it's true. <laughs> like, um, it's really, yeah, it's about your input because community is made of individuals. So to sit around and think someone else is going to do it, and no one else is doing it. The only way to make real lasting change is what Candy said, is to be the change, to actually actively participate in change. And that could be at your own level. You don't need to suddenly take over and join whatever community. You could literally just come and add and ask questions and, and help and support your community in any way that you want. Um, I'm a public speaker now, as of this moment. So <laughs> thanks for being here. <laughs> um, so I suppose, yeah, just be more actively participating in your community. You don't need to go to London. And protests are completely a waste of time. Everyone stop protesting, please. Please stop going to protests. It's a complete waste of your time. Protest is an exertion of energy that makes you feel good. Would that you is say, it. Would you say writing, signing petitions is a waste of time as well? Then? Um, no, but another thing about protests is they're fun. Um, you get to meet loads of cool people, like-minded people. You get to dance and, and, yeah. and, and annoy the police. It's a visual representation of the world. Yeah, well. I know, but real change is yeah, in here. Remember, the change. revelation, it's a revelation in the minds of the people. This is why education is so important. This is why I'm now on a mission to do this. Because it's not really about what what happens to everyone who goes to a protest. One million people in London, what do they do? They go back to work the next day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they go and pay all their taxes. What are you doing? You know, real, real change is like, you know, let's get five million people outside Buckingham Palace for five weeks, not moving. You know, that's a, that's a real protest. Like, 
um, and not pay your toll. Real, and another thing about the system is um, money is time and energy. Money is time and energy. You only have money because you've exerted some amount of time and a certain amount of energy. And you're getting a physical representation of that time and energy back into your pocket. If you understand, in the 17th century, a document was produced for the Rothschilds banking family that they were time lords. They were the lords of time because they had control over everyone's time. <coughs> because they controlled the money, they controlled the time. Now this gets quite philosophical, but you don't need to give your time and energy to anyone if you don't want to give it to someone. Just decide that your time and energy is your time and energy. And when you were born, you were completely naked, you had no friends, you had no possessions, you had nothing, you were just vulnerable and naked. And it's only as we raised in a society that we've created all of these ideas that we need to be doing things, because we were told that we needed to be doing them. So just choose wisely where you put your time and energy. Because I don't think a woman with a gold hat who lives in a marble castle should have any of my time and energy. And I don't care who this woman is, whether it's the Queen of England or any person on the earth. I don't believe that prime ministers and politicians and all of those people who have a lot of money and a lot of power should be taking any of my time and energy. Like, I just don't think that's how the world should be. I think all politicians should work completely for free. And in the future, if I ever become one, it'll be for free. Just do it for free. Do it because you love your constituency. You do it because you love the nation you're representing. And you don't want any money in it. As long as I have a house to sleep in, and I've got some food and a car, then that's fine. I'll do it for free. As soon as you involve money in politics, it's over. Like, it's over. People are being bought and sold and lobbied and manipulated and bought. And it's just, it's just an absolute mess. So I turn into a political rant. Uh, I'll move from law into politics. I'll vote, yeah. You'll vote for me. Okay, you've got one vote. Woohoo! Okay, so I'm going to talk about sovereignty now. Now we're going to move from law into a little bit of a woohoo spiritual conversation. Because sovereignty is intrinsically linked with law for a reason. How are we doing for time? About 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay, I'll go this quick. Sovereignty. Claiming your sovereignty is. Call it a spiritual awakening, call it an epiphany, call it the penny dropping, call it whatever you want. It can happen, it does happen to people, and you realize your true nature, you could say, your true essence. And in doing so, it's unquestionable who you are. You're, for instance, I'm not up here reading a script, I'm just talking to you naturally. I'm not having to think about anything that I'm saying. That in and of itself is my sovereignty. It's me claiming some level of authority. In order for me to stand here in front of all of you, I have to talk with a level of authority. I have to claim my own authority, my own sovereignty, and say, I know this subject better than, any, better than anyone in this town, because I've dedicated 10 years of my life to the subject. And it, it's funny because we, as a, as a population, are raised without any, whether you believe in God or whether you have some kind of religious connotation, or you're raised with faith, whether you're Jewish or Christian or Muslim or Hindu, there's still, I know a lot of religious people who haven't realized their own sovereignty. They still follow the rules and regulations of the Christian church, and they do all the things. That's just you following another institution. That's just you following more rules and not doing your own thing. You're not following your own passion. You're not following your own truth. So sovereignty is when you realize that you don't need to do what other people are doing. And you don't, just because loads of people are walking in this direction doesn't mean you have to also walk in that direction. You can decide to look somewhere else. You can decide to study something else, eat something else, be friends with other people, go to countries you've never been to before. You can decide and you basically become the decision maker of your own life. You can call it the birth of responsibility where you take full responsibility for all of your own actions, all of your own feelings, all of your own thoughts, and you stand in that, that is sovereignty. Which means, in terms of authority, if we look at here, oh right. we've got the queen at this end, and you've got the people at this end. In order for the queen to maintain, because in the eyes of God, in the eyes of any religion, everyone is even. It says in the Bible, we're all born even. If we're all born even, how can someone dictate to someone else what they should do? If we're all the same? Through authority. So what they do is they write notices and they author 
authority themselves above us. And they use the legal language, they use laws to create their authority. They use words and language. And this all comes from Merlin and King Arthur and all of these stories about magic and all of this stuff is completely legitimate. The reason these people have all the power is because they understand magic, basically. And if you watched, has anyone here watched the Queen's coronation in 1953? You've seen it? I saw it with my dad. You saw it with him? I saw it with my dad who we sat and ate sardine sandwiches in the hall all day. And they went up on a steamer in Kent at four o'clock in the morning. Um, went up at four o'clock in the morning. How old are you? the mall and saw the coach, the Hanoverian coach of the horses and saw the young queen. I saw it all. Well, how old are you when this happened? I'm 82. Okay, so for a bit of it, uh, a six, of seventeen. Three in me. So you I were ten, it. around ten. I years. sucked it in, sir. I sucked it in. <laughs> helping me in the same way that you're helping me. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so yeah, if you watch the Queen's coronation, it is a ritual. It is a ceremonial ritual. I watched it, watched it for hours in a black and white on YouTube. And it's literally, it's a, it's a ceremony, ritualistic magic. Change the words or something and give away our sovereignty or something in that. Um, so some of the words you say, she you think you say one thing, but she actually says something else. Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fascinating to watch because I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a woman of her age standing with the entire nation, like hundreds of bishops, archbishops of Canterbury, you've got kings and lords, and you've got people everywhere. And at one point, there's a guy in a purple robe and a big hat with a diamond encrusted sword walking around reading a 300 year old document. And he's walking around the queen, he's like, Ish Elibon de la Bandi, Alamanda. Here there's a guy with smoke. And I'm like, this is, this is magic. These people are literally. Um, giving her her power through intention, through ritualistic magic. They're reading spells out of old manuscripts. They're reading Latin, they're reading Greek, they're reading English. They are masters of what they do, and that's why she stands today with a crown on her head and says, you got to do what you're told, because you, I own you. I'm the, I'm the queen. You have no idea what it, that level of perception in order to be a queen. You don't have no idea what it's like to put your face on money. Like, you're the, everyone in the world knows you, because your face is on all the Canadian magnets, New Zealand, Australia, billions of people look at your face every day. That is insane. And it takes a certain level of individual to know that, and to stand in that as well. It's a very powerful thing to be, and when you read Machiavelli philosophy, you realize that the people at the top, they're powerful people. They're, they're powerful people, they, they, they're not just accepting they're creating. They're, they're not just accepting their reality and going, oh yeah, this is it. They're literally actively participating in the creation of their own reality. And that makes them in and of themselves powerful people. Now, not that we should compare ourselves to these people, but they do exist. And the trickle-down effect of their system is impacting us financially. And it's, this, is why I'm, this is why I want to speak about this topic, because if we can alleviate some of the stresses and tensions that we have as a collective, not just in small communities, but as a nation. Um, my brother's filmed this, so it's going to go on YouTube. I'll be sharing this on YouTube and then doing... I don't know where my brother's gone, actually. Oh, i going for a walk. He got bored and went home. He was like, oh, I've heard all this before. Um, so sovereignty is standing in your truth. Now, when you become sovereign, you, can, you don't have to ask someone's permission to do this. You literally decide it, and you stand by it. You, you don't budge. You don't budge. You just say, this is it, this is how it is, and this is my truth. You can write a declaration of your own sovereignty and you can write it in law. Yes, sir? How can you, how can you be so sure that you, you won't end up like someone like the Queen when you take that sovereignty? Because you're, um, by me claiming my sovereignty back, I'm, I'm not trying to lord it over anyone. My sovereignty doesn't come with authority. It only comes with my own sense of authority. Like, I'm not trying to put my sovereignty over anyone in this room. I'm not trying to tell anyone in this room what they can and cannot do. Um, the Queen 
has, be has been given her sovereignty by the people. The people essentially have allowed the queen to be the queen because we didn't know any different. <laughs> we were born and there was a king and then the king died and then the queen was here and we look and we're told that history has always had kings and queens and we just don't question it. We don't question our reality. We just accept that this is the way that it is. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sometimes I feel there are things that I want to do. Yeah. But I'm afraid they're coming from ego as opposed to yeah. um, you know yeah. divine inspiration or you know, a, yeah. a true place. Yeah, I mean So you could say that sovereignty is the dissolving of the ego. Because your false sense of self as you meditate, as you pray, as you go through that as you go on that journey your false sense of self evaporates. It gets less and less and less intrinsic. And it's not that we ever really want to get rid of the ego because in terms of sociality, in terms of interacting, we need a front. We need a personality. Because if we didn't, we would just be like these autonomous beings who don't have any personality. And we'd be just speaking. We need some kind of interaction. We need some kind of um, something to rub against. The ego can be a positive thing or it can be a negative thing. For instance, someone who has audacity, who's going out into the world to speak their truth, is using their ego to do it. But he's purified his mental and emotional bodies so that he's not triggered. He's not trying to lord it over everyone. Um, if the ego is a negative, insecure people, for instance, who have a level of insecurity or a level of low self-worth, which I could put my hand up and say I spent most of my life in that state, you, your ego becomes a defense mechanism. It becomes a way of controlling situations. You could say that these people at the top are very egotistical. You could say that they're possessed by it in a way. They have to maintain control over the population. They have to maintain some kind of manipulation over the population. And that is, it is what it is. <laughs> I don't try not to label it. Because if you understand this symbol fully, you've all seen the symbol. The yin and yang. If you understand yin and yang in terms of spiritual philosophy, this explains everything. This actually explains everything that we ever experience. Um, in terms of, in order for there to be good, there has to be bad. In order for there to be uh, bad, there has to be good. This is lots of bad people with good people, and this is a, this is a bad person with a little bit of good, and this is a good person with a little bit of bad. And there isn't a supremely good person, there isn't a supremely bad person, because there has to be a little bit in each, each one. But you just have to decide, the queen I wouldn't consider as a nice person. I would not consider her a nice person. And anyone with an unlimited budget, with an unlimited resources, who doesn't actively participate in the betterment of humanity, is an asshole. And I would just call it straight. If you're not actively participating with all of your money and all of your resources and all of your power and you're not trying to make the world a better place, then please leave this planet and just go somewhere else. So her sovereignty is toxic because although she's sovereign, she's not contributing to anything. She's like a tourist attraction now. People go and look at her house and they're like, wow, she's in the house and they wave flags at her. And it's just this incredible money-making uh, thing that London has. But... You know, I haven't heard the Queen or any of the royals. They open hospitals, they fund things, they do poundry over in Dorchester. But it's all just investments for their own... It's all just lining their own pockets. Like, they're not actually doing anything, it's contributing anything. Um, so... I don't know how long we've got, five minutes? Okay, cool. Does anyone... Let's have a Q&A just for the last five, ten minutes so we can answer any questions. Anyone have anything they want to say? Hello. You mentioned Machiavelli quite a few times. So, is the, the, any end, the means to do it, the people in power, is justified based on, the, that's the Machiavelli thing, so yeah. that, that's why we're vulnerable, that's right. because they could do anything to us, that's right. to get what they want. Yeah, and they will, and they do. Yeah, I mean, Mac, does anyone know, is anyone familiar with Machiavelli? He was an author in Italy, Italy and he was a very well-educated man, and he was very close to the king, and he wrote a book called The Prince, and... The king basically said, my son is too young to take the throne and he's too young to understand what it is to be a king. I need you to come to my chamber and I'm gonna tell you all of the secrets to what it is to be a great king. 
And when he's 16, I want you to give him the book. It's called The Prince. So Machiavelli was given the power to know the, the secrets. And then he literally, it was given to this king, this prince. Um, and then about 200 years later, someone made a copy of it and published it. So it was in their family for 200 years, being passed down generation to generation. Uh, Machiavelli was an incredible man because he understood royalty at a very high level. He understood that these people are actually terrified. What he understood from the king is that the king lives in a perpetual state of fear all the time. Doesn't trust anyone, cannot trust anyone. Even the guy he has in his army doesn't trust him. Could be looking to kill him at any moment. And he learned over the generations with the, his interaction with royalty is that they're all petrified. We think that the queen is terrified of what we're going to do to her. Prince Charles is terrified about what we're going to find out about him. And we already know that he's done a lot. Yeah. You don't need to dig too far with Prince Charles to know that he's been up to all kinds of shenanigans. So they're terrified about us. Because we're millions, about Jimmy as well, yeah. Like we're, we're millions of people. And they're 27 people. <laughs> like that's how little the, the, the ratio is. Is we are 70 million and there's a hundred cabinet ministers, you know? There's not many of them. How many, how many people at the top of a pyramid? One, two, maybe three? In a corporation, you've got a CEO, but you may have 50,000 employees, but you've only got one CEO, maybe two executives. So if you think about in terms of millions of people in a country, let's just say there's 2,000 at the top doing all of this. It's not a lot of people, but it's geniusly done that they follow, we have to follow the rules and the regulations of the Crown Corporation, and we just follow orders. We just keep following orders because of fear, because we're afraid of what might happen to us if we don't. And it all comes down to love and fear. Love and fear. You literally have, every, in this reality, we have duality. We have up, down, left, right, in, out, hot, cold. Everything is dual in this reality. So. If we're gonna have good people, we just have to accept there's gonna be bad people. That's part of, you know, if we're gonna have a Luke Skywalker, we're gonna have a Darth Vader, that these things work perfectly together. A film without Darth Vader would be a really crap film. Like, we need the bad guy in the film to make the good guy look good. Because if there was no bad guy, it'd just be a good guy not knowing what to do. What do I do now? Just eating tacos, like, not knowing what to do. So the bad guy is an incredible, resistance to the good and in a way this is why I'm not an advocate for fighting the system but understanding the system because in the understanding we we get out of this situation basically as we all wake up and and just stand in our own power basically You would just end up doing what you're doing now. Yes. And he says, if you, if you could dream up any dream any night of the week, he says, after a couple of years, you would, after dreaming of the most outrageous things and the best lovers and the best drugs and the best food and the best mountains, and eventually you get bored of it and eventually you would just dream up the life that you're currently living, just for a laugh. <laughs> because uh, that's the way reality is. So uh, I think just, you know, everyone's life is as valid as the next. You know, don't, and don't compare yourself to anyone. Like, that's the key to what Alan Moss is always talking about anyway. Yeah. <coughs> so, thank you so much for joining today. I hope you understand the law a little bit better today. Thank you so much. Thanks. Is everybody feel more empowered now? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, we're going to take a break now for lunch. So we've got about half an hour. Um, I think we're going to try and do some teas and coffees if we can. There's some water at the back if you want some. But um, if you can be back for about um, um, 1.30. And then we're going to look at what the other assemblies are doing and what action groups and what things we can do as a community and uh, be more of a discussion, really more interactive, hope, you know. Um, so, yeah, see you in about half an hour. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
I mean, he's, he's, he's done public before because he, he's a musician, so, yeah. but actually to, it's it's yeah, thing. completely, yeah, I think this is still running. My other son had to go, and he said, I've left it running, I don't know if Chris has turned it off or not. Yeah, don't know, I'll leave it running anyway. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sort of like the only other name you know, Wax and Stamp, you're, you're the you're corporation guy, we'll have you. <laughs> yeah. I've got a lot of friends, I've got one of my friends, all the words that I have, all the colour that I have, painting and modern section, all the notes that I have in my music. Because of the lockdown, it was because of the marriage of the Because of the uh, Yeah, something happened in the way we were going. There was nothing more important than one thing. Yeah. I'll try and not, you know, I, I do like work.